All right, we're back. Episode number seven, Q&A with Mitch and Jay, where we take uh, questions from our athletes, from the run-free training community, from the athletes we coach, from the coaches we work with, uh, from anyone that interacts with us on socials, uh, YouTube, Instagram, all of those places, and pick the most interesting questions, and then we chat about them. All right, Mitch, so what do you got? What's our first one today? Yeah, so I had some questions this week regarding like, how do I move through kind of the recuperation of training with, uh, with an injury or through an injury or letting that injury heal itself and then continue to train? Like, what does that process look like? And I know there's always a tendency to just like, like you do want to get back to training. Like, I want to get back to training too. But there's kind of this like this uniquely uh, this like unique period of one day after a treatment or after you've uh, been injured or tried to help that injury along. It's kind of this period of one day where you can make a big difference by like letting your body rest. So there's a couple of trajectories of of uh, post injury, right? So like we look at an injury. Uh, and then treatments, so dry needles, soft tissue work, uh, mobilizations, all that good stuff. And then could be almost instantly, or it could be uh, down the road, maybe three or four days or two days, where you start to feel a little bit more comfortable. And you want to say, okay, well, what, what's the next move? And that's like a very important decision. And these are trajectories that I've seen it go through. So <clears throat> there's the first move where, okay, I'm ready to go. And you train a little bit and you feel it and you train and you feel it and you progress a little bit, you come back down. But e whatever happens in this on this trajectory, you're still thinking about it. You're still moderating effort, moderating like your movement and being a little bit protective. And that stage I've seen go on for a long time. You're talking about a month out, someone's still being concerned about it because you never really gave yourself the opportunity to like let go of it completely, especially mentally, right? Um, one of the other ones is like, okay, I'm good to go. And then obviously you see people say, let's roll and then re-injure. Now we start in the whole thing. Um, and as soon as that second injury happens, if it's the same, what we start to look at is like, okay, now there's a higher chance of like something chronic building. Okay. So, so um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to, I want to throw in something here. So you said one day, yeah. but it could be three days. It could, but then you start to get into the whole, like the, the rest that people don't want to do. I think that one day, if time correctly offers you an opportunity to rest fully on a day and be kind to your body and then get back at it. Where the two or three days, a lot of people, if I was two or three days out, I'm getting restless. I'm in a bad mood. I'm, I'm in you know, I'm in the web of sticky thoughts. Like I'm just like, I'm coming down, you know? And I think with the one day where it's completely nothing to, to treat your body well. And, and honestly, from my perspective, give it the respect it deserves. Like it gives you so much, just give it a day. You know, I think that's a middle ground to say, okay, you got this one day and then let's see what goes. You know, a lot of people will get 20 different treatments. You can't tell what's working. But after every treatment, it's like, okay, treatment, let's see if it works. Let me go test it. And then you're in this like treatment test, step down, treatment test, like sort of spiral of death that's just going <laughs> to last forever, you know? Um, so I just, I, I just want to offer the perspective of like, when you get injured, think about how much you've taken from your body. And then you put in all the soft tissue work, you put in the treatment, maybe you've paid money to do that. Maybe you've paid in hours and time and effort and discomfort. Well, now it's time to like, okay, it's feeling good. Let me just take this day to like reset and give my body the opportunity to like really let these things sink in. I think that first day is like magic. And if you can avoid the trick, which is I feel good, let's roll. For one day, I think you like, I think it's a huge step forward versus kind of trickling in and making it this sort of mental, mental game as we go through. What are your thoughts on that? Here, here's how I look at it. Um, first of all, I totally agree about um, 
treating your body kind and recognizing what it's given to you. I think of it like if you had the flu, what would you do? You wouldn't go run. Like you can't, you know, you feel it. Yeah. You feel it that like if you have the flu, I actually did some research on this a few years back. And if you go run when you have the flu, you extend it by like 12 to 24 more hours. Like it's that. Yeah. It, yeah. It like knocks you way back down. Now, if you have like a cold or something that's not as severe as the flu, a 20 to 30 minute run at 60% and under heart rate, it actually helps you get better faster. So we've all experienced that, like a little head cold, you go for a short run, it gets some of that junk out, it's better. So I think of injuries like that. And I try to tell myself, is this the flu or is this just like a common cold? Yeah. Like how severe is it? And I try to be honest with myself. Yeah. And if I get that flu warning. So the other thing I think that I'm going to add to this is age. Right. Like yeah. you don't recover as fast when you're 40 plus as you do when you're 18. I mean, yeah. you just don't have the same hormonal support. And so I've gotten to the point where I'm willing to take two days, maybe even that third day. If I feel like it's it's flu. Oh man, this is, this could be bad. This could be like a potential tear or like it hurts every step when I walk. Yeah. And then if it's common cold ish, then the day is totally fine. But I, but I bring up the flu and the common cold because basically what's happening when you're injured is a part of your body is sick. Yeah. It's not well, it's not healthy. So why would you continue to just drill it yeah. and not, and not like be nice to yourself and yeah. let it recover? So that's kind of like how I put it in perspective for myself. And, and I've actually gotten to the point mentally where I'm fine. I'm totally fine. Two, three days if I need to take it. Yeah. Doesn't really bother me. I don't get into those sticky thoughts because I've experienced it so many times where it went yeah. well. Yeah. And it also helps in that period to, to stay out of that negative place by like, why don't you go and do a row or get on the bike or something like that, you know, instead of, uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like you, you equating it to the flu. It's like the day you feel better on the flu, flu you don't do like an 18 month. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Just chill on it a little bit. It's gonna be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, so you I just, will have you'll have the flu again. Yeah, if yeah. You do that. You run yeah. into the flu. So yeah, I just I guess it's just like what I'm saying is give you know give that time on the front end because you don't want to do it again. Like give it. You don't want to intersperse these like negative thoughts throughout your months and season. Give your time on the front end. You'll feel you'll feel rusty, quote unquote, for the next one, maybe, you know, depending on how many times you're running. But like even I would argue the rustiness It's just like just take it on the front end and then reap the rewards. And sometimes yeah. that, that that is hard to do, but I just recommend it. And obviously this is after like hours and hours of your treatment. Right. Just let yeah. it sit in feel good about it and then go. And then the next step, by the way, is not let's test it to its nth degree, right? Because we always look at, I'm going to go out and test it. And I say, I tell athletes, testing it, finding its limit is 1% away from re-injury. So like, why don't you just go, if you think you can do 60 meters, 60 minutes, do 45 and call it a call it a solid day you know like that's not going to be the game changer there so yeah. like it's about these positive experiences working through coming back i feel like that is something that i learned from you uh last year and that stuck with me mentally and is such a great picture is don't when you're injured don't test it don't go to the limit of it and then go backwards like that makes total sense yeah Like, don't even go up to that level. Like, just let it continue to heal. And I think, you know, we had an athlete uh, with Run Free that um, had an IT band issue. And 
she continued to test it yeah uh over and over again and then it ended up taking like eight to 12 weeks i think it was yeah. to get over it and it was because of two to three times that it was tested yeah and it shouldn't have been and we've all made that mistake like i'm oh, not zeroing on a, that a, yeah it's so trend, hard right yeah yeah and yeah. and you know yes the obviously you want to see progress from whether it's from 45 to 60 minutes and so now you can do speed sessions all that so what i recommend though is that we like the goal is for you to never feel that spot ever again. So it's like, if I want to feel it, I could at any point make any part of my body injured, right? That's not the test. The test is, can I go out and have a solid uh, confidence building workout? And then the confidence grows and then you just ease into it. Um, and then I feel like, wouldn't you just rather never have that injury ever again? You don't even think about it. It's not even in your... Um, in, in your scope of athleticism. Like that's the goal. The goal is not you, like, oh, got it. <laughs> you, know? you, you fr what, when you know you've gotten there is when you can't remember which leg it was. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like I've had that. I'm like, I know I had something yeah. <laughs> last year, but yeah. I don't even know what leg it was. I can't yeah. remember. <laughs> and it's funny um, because when, because I, I'm so sensitive to my body and I had a specific injury for a long time. I can... If I think about it nonstop, I can make it hurt or I can make it uncomfortable. So like the other day I was dealing with a little pain and then I went to like a jujitsu class and then afterwards I was hurting somewhere else. Didn't think about that other pain. Right. And it's very similar. Like if you're running an ultra or even sometimes a marathon, part of it is like you feel a pain. You're like, this is the end. Then two minutes later, you don't even remember what that pain was. And you're yeah. fine. You know, you're in the yeah. Okay, so I want to lean into something that you mentioned. Um, but first, I got to ask a question that I've, I kind of thought of at the beginning. It's been, it's been bothering me. Like, dude, why are you wearing a shirt? Bro, well, it's, I specialize in aggressive uh, animal shirts. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's my specialty, and I haven't got the shirtless request yet, so I'm going to leave that. No, well, but I mean, I'm I'm just used to the tank. I didn't know what was. Yeah, up. that's there's, true. That's true. What? What is that? Yeah, uh, I'm is first, super. Yeah, I'm I'm off the beach right now. Put it that oh, way. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll, I'll I'm go. in flag. All right, you're in flag right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll let you go then. I, I'll, Thanks, I won't dude. I won't harp on it too much. Um, but yeah, what I want to, what I want to mention is like, uh, that rustiness. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I was in grad school, we had a great professor that leaned into, uh, why do you feel that way after you take two to three days off? Are yeah. you out of shape? Like what happened? And, uh, I'm sure there's lots and lots of reasons, but he brought up several that were like groundbreaking to me. And I always share them with athletes when they're coming back because it's encouragement. So one thing that happens when you take three days off is your blood volume immediately goes down. So you're not exercising. You're not demanding your body get hot and use more water. And so you shed it. And your blood, your blood actually gets thicker. Yeah. And so it's harder for your heart to pump it. But the cool thing is that blood volume comes back in like two or three days. So it's like an instant improvement. Yeah. And then uh, the, the other one is mostly neurological. So your, your neurons, when you don't use them, they don't fire as synchronously and they don't fire as fast. And so you feel uncoordinated and yeah. you feel out of it because your body just did not fire for a few days and it got depressed, like yeah. neurologically depressed. That comes back in three or four days. And so I always tell athletes, I'm like, dude, don't even worry about it. You're not, you did not lose mitochondrial density. Yeah. You didn't lose oxygen transportation ability. You didn't lose power. You didn't lose speed your muscles didn't get weaker. Yeah. Like the two things that come back the fastest are your neurological system and your blood volume. Yeah. And so you, you just got to go like three days and then you're back where you were. 
and it's so funny because all the time, you know, what happens, Mitch, when you have an athlete that takes three days off, three days later, they run a great workout and they're like, I can't believe it. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I wasn't out of shape after all. (laughs) And so I just love sharing that tidbit uh, with athletes because it gives you that tangible uh, physiology to like hold on to and be like, oh, it, I just gotta, I just gotta get hot a couple more times. My yeah. blood will get less thick and more viscous, easier yeah. to pump, and then my muscles are fire better after just Sweet. a couple of days. Yeah. I yeah. Hey, so I wanted to talk a little bit, Jay, about. Um, I was trying to, I was trying to think of like how can. How, what movement, is there one position, one movement that can help people out there that may not have like a deep understanding of the body? How can they see their own weaknesses? Because part of like all the mobility we teach and the soft tissue work, part of that is like the assessment, right? Like what is my body doing today so that I don't just jump into something that maybe it's not ready for. Um, so in movement, there's, there's these what are considered archetypes, like the sc- the squat is a movement archetype that's used for specific sports. Uh, a lunge is like an archetype that fits really well with, with running. And what I found is when I put even, when I put the majority of people in a lunge position, it's so easy for me to say, Hey, do you see your weakness? And it's like immediate, they can see it. They can feel it. You as a, uh, second eye can like see where they don't have confidence and sometimes it's like confidence at the top or they drop or sometimes the ankle and the foot just don't even know what to do and sometimes it's the knee sometimes being in the elongated and shortened hip position um, is like is odd for someone and I just think like as runners we could take a lot from like just looking at the the lunge archetype so just get in a lunge that's you don't necessarily like knee on the back knee on the ground just get in like a long lunge with a back leg is like relatively straight okay um and if you can't get in that position that's kind of like first clue um you know where we should be able to extend have that hip fully extended with almost a straight leg behind us right and it's not about worrying about is the knee over the toe is it not over the toe get in like what you feel is a strong position And then it's time to assess, okay, like, do I feel confident here in stability? If I were to push power or do a walking lunge out of this position, do I have any power? Like, do I know how to access power out of this position? Um, If someone came up to me and pushed pushed me, can I at least like hold on tight for a couple seconds? Um, If I move my upper body in a certain way, does it completely throw off some chain where I can like, you know, these, this is an opportunity to assess the role of an athlete is it's not just about doing the training in front of you. Like you have to wake up in the morning and see, like, if you're going hard in training, it's very important to like assess, like, where's my body at today. Right. Um, and then also if you're just coming through something, you're just beginning or you're coming through an injury or getting into a new training block. A lot of times those long, those, some of those longer breaks between, races or training blocks or recovery we can establish some um some bad movement patterns why don't you just check just get in the lunge each position see if you can notice what is the weak point and then you can once we've assessed then you can say okay i know um i know my knee stability is not there like i just don't feel confident as soon as my knee goes over my toe or over my ankle i don't feel confident well then you know like okay well let's start working some of that v- that vmo let's start working some of the sort of uh uh more uh deeper knee flexion movements so you can build confidence in the knee and hit the ground and drive through um so what you eventually want is you want to be able to assess and then you want to reference the kind of database of soft tissue and stability and mobility work that um that at run free you know the one percent offers you and then you reference that and then we start putting this puzzle together and then you get back in this position and say okay i am more stable here and it's like a very concrete way of assessing fixing retesting um and it's so easy and even if someone else walked in the room they'd be like dude, that doesn't look good. You're not, you don't look very strong in that position, right? 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried that, Jay, or um, or what are your thoughts on that? So a couple of things. Uh, one is, yes, I've noticed instabilities in myself in different movement patterns, in different positions. And one thing that I would uh, point out on that is um, sometimes it's just practicing the position. For sure, yeah. Like the strength is there. Yeah. Like the stability isn't quite there yet because you're not, I love the way you say it, you're not comfortable in that position or confident in that yeah. position. Um, one of the things that's helped me a ton is the hip spin up. Yeah. Like, like being more confident in the lunge position, mm -hmm. man, if you really get your hips mobile, then you could use some of the strength that you have yeah. in them and the stability. Yeah. But if they're immobile, you can't really use your strength and stability because you're at the end limit. Of yeah. where you can go already. Yeah, you can't so think, access. You can't access yeah. areas to turn on or fire, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you don't have that mobility, you can't access yeah. your strength. And you know, when I get asked about yoga, like I'm a runner, should I do yoga? Obviously, it depends on the level that you're running at. But I think yoga is huge for like if you go to a yoga class and you're not in the lunge position a lot. It's less about the flexibility and the mobility. It's more about like if you go through, if you go to a yoga class and you 15 minutes of that, you're in this deep lunge, right? Like that's a huge benefit to you feeling a connection between your hip extension and flexion at the same time. And where's the stability coming from when you're moving your arms? I think that's one of the best benefits to get out of a yoga practice is like you do spend that you're in that warrior two, warrior one, or just a deep lunge. Um, and you actually get that time there where if I said, hey, you're going to spend 15 minutes of lunch today and you weren't doing yoga, someone would be very hesitant. But um, I just wanted to bring attention. I think that's a really good position to like assess your body and then move on with whether it's opening something or strength. If something feels blocked, you hit some sort of mobilization. There's tools for these and they've been done for millennia. All you need is the all you need is the information and to have that database to reference. And that's one of the things I bring joy. I get joy bringing to athletes is like surprising them. Be like, hey, I, we know what that is and we can fix it. Like I have here, do this tool. We can make a difference here. Um, so yeah, I encourage every, all athletes to do that. Yeah, and uh, you know, just quick plug on if you don't know if you're listening and you're like, dude, I have no idea if I'm stable or instable. Like we have a service where you can hit us up and we can do a one-time assessment and look at that and give you some tips, even if you don't want coaching, like ongoing coaching. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that's totally available because I'm sure there's people out there listening that don't know how to assess their body yeah, and yeah. don't know, and don't know, like we're saying these things and they're like, well, that's great. You're saying them, but <laughs> yeah. I have no clue how to assess yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. And so that's something we can help with. And actually this summer, we just had um, a call about our camp this summer, our run free camp. And man, uh, we're going to focus on re accessing, connecting our bodies with our minds. Sweet. Like that's going to be one of the themes. Love it. Because uh, one of the things that, uh, Ryan and I were chatting about is, you know, all this data we're getting, heart rate data, aura data, whoop data, recovery data. Um, if you wear all these devices, none of them agree with each other. <laughs> That's, yeah, I've seen that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying don't use them, but, you know, I've done a 10 mile run before and run you know, 6.30 the last mile, but my watch says 9.47. Uh, okay. You know, yeah. and, and heart rate data is off all the time. And, yeah. you know, so we really do still, even though we use these devices, we still need to have the intuitive part of our bodies where we can assess it and we know how we feel. Yeah. Because um, you don't want to finish a workout 
and then your watch says you got to take 72 hours recovery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like, I just cruised five miles, dude. Yeah, yeah, that was easy. <laughs> yeah. I'm like 100% ready to go tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. But my watch. So, uh, so Ryan was telling us about this athlete um, that got in touch with him and was like, uh, or maybe it was Chad was saying that they were doing a tempo run and their watch said the heart rate was too low, too high. Yeah, yeah. And so they slowed down, but they felt fine. Yeah. And, that, and they slowed down more. They slowed down to walking. And it was still. <laughs> and it was still too high. Yeah. And it, was just an, it was just an error on the watch. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, we want to get back to where we can assess our bodies and like, we're not afraid to do that. Yeah. 100%. And dude, yeah. so you brought up like, when I say confidence, like that's one of my favorite ways to describe how we should feel like if it's post-injury one we want you to have confidence that not only is that not going to break your next step or your next run but you can put force through it at the right angle right it's confidence in daily training it's confidence in life like if you go out and run in the morning and it's healthy and it feels good it doesn't have to be a pr run just doing it you are you better that day right so like yeah if you go on a run, you feel this little like ache and pain. That's going to be, I don't know about you. That's going to be with me all day. I'm going to be trying to figure that out. Right. It's like little chips of the confidence. And you can also do that in reverse where it's like huge gains. Okay. I can move really well. Okay. I'm stable in this position. So when you're looking, when you're assessing yourself, ask yourself, like what position does your body not like? And there's probably a, there's probably a reason when we get, if we get past the ego, there's probably a, uh, we could probably nail down that position. And there's probably a really good reason why it doesn't like that. And I encourage you to get in there and really like find that position. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Sweet. Well, um, last question. Uh, and this is a, this is probably one that deserves its own uh, standalone episode, but we'll, we'll touch on it as much as we can is there's so many ways I, I was talking with a bunch of athletes uh, in the last few weeks because I'm exploring and have been for a couple years now. There's so many ways to build speed, to build power. You can't do them all um, and you can't do them all the time. So you do have to pick and choose. Like, what are you going to do when? And then there's a limited amount of energy you have as well. So if I'm going to run, 30, 50, 60 miles a week, it's going to be very difficult to do plyos three times a week, to lift weights three times a week, to do hill sprints, to do I just wanted to chat back and forth about how all these components fit together. And in my mind, they build on each other. And so the way I think of it is my foundational part and I love, I want you to pick a, pick this apart and see if I'm missing anything. Okay. Like my foundational part is just my general ability to move. Like it's my ability to do the lunge position. It's my ability to have ankle flexion. It's the ability that my big toe that I worked on a lot last year can move. Like that's the foundational part. And then the next step is that I have something to push off of when I'm running. Like that my strength in my hips, my low back, even my chest and my arms is solid enough to where I can drive through the ground with whatever strength I have currently. Yeah. And then my next step is to build more power, is to go in the weight room, lift heavy, do some big movements, hex bar deadlifts, one of our favorite single leg deadlift, step ups like some actual strengthening movements. But then, so I have the ability to move. I'm now strong. I have something to push through. But I haven't actually run fast yet. And so for me, connecting the weightlifting to the fast running, I like doing that with hill sprints and uphill work because it makes my form better. It makes me turn over and I'm pushing off through my body with resistance. And if you don't have good form uphill, you're going to fall. 
Yeah. Like you have to catch yourself. Um, the next step to that is doing some type of flat sprinting, 60s, 30s, 150s, um, and with big rest. And the hill sprints, big rest too, two minutes, two and a half minutes. And then we've got to start connecting it with actual workouts per event. Like what event are you training for? The marathon speed is going to look different from 5K, 10K or the mile speed. So yeah, what, what pieces am I missing? Like what, what order of events, it, would you change the order? Like, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, and I don't wanna, I'm on, I don't wanna like assume authority on this subject. I just, I, you know, I, in my opinion, you know, I've run, when I was playing rugby, I ran a 10-6, okay? And that's, you know, out of the elite sprinters, you know, it's not elite, but that's, that's moving, right? I got there by not, I was always more of an 800 guy. Like I would, like at my core, I'm an 800 guy, but outside with my ego, I want to be a sprinter. Okay. So I just made uh-huh. myself a sprinter that came through these things. And I think you're, I think you're on, I think you're on the right track, but I think it needs to be exaggerated a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take, uh, let's just take rest time so let's work in the workouts okay you tell a two minute rest to work on speed okay i'm talking about a four to six minute rest to work on speed because how speed the principle of explosive development is this you to in order to do a workout that's explosive you have to be able to rec- replicate let's say your maximum jump is um 24 inches hopefully not then if you can't on your next set if you once you drop below like 21 inches you call it okay because you're not replicating your highest jump you've changed body systems completely what you're now replicating is uh speed endurance okay so what we look at is like if you're doing hundreds and you can do a hundred you do a hundred in this like 14 seconds well, as soon as you can't do a, and you're just repeating and going every four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, um, once you can't re- repeat anything under maybe like 15, five or something like that, maybe 16, you're done. It's not even, it's not, you're not, not only you're not benefiting, you're just completely switching body systems. So it's like a very methodical approach, approach to rest, like you have to get more rest. When I was doing uh, beach beach volleyball or rugby, and I'm just working on just absolute power to the ground, speed of movement, speed of contraction, I'm doing, whether it's plyometrics or complex training where you mix weights plus plyos, but then you're just sitting there for six to eight minutes. Like you're in the gym for two hours, you've done you know five sets of things. And it is quite annoying, but it's what you have to do to... That's why you always see the sprinters kind of cruising around just talking. They are on a legitimate rest there. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to replicate that intensity, right? And obviously you can work through, work backwards. Like you don't have to do that if you're like a marathon runner. But if you're trying to do like, if you're already a fast miler and you've kind of reached your breaking point, there's going to be a point where you need to get faster. Because in the end, like that's, that's your that's your weakness like you need to get faster so when we talk about speed of contraction we're talking about long rests okay yeah second of all in the weight room speed of contraction so we're talking about explosive jump squats just with like a dumbbell and whether it's jumping high or sprinting as fast as you can it's not about how hard you push it's a how it's about how fast you push Okay, so you have to be like a like love a stiff, that like a stiff. I love spring. that. It's not about when you try and jump high. Someone says jump as high as you can right now, and you like load up. You've been in a squat for like ten seconds, trying to think about how high you're gonna jump, and it doesn't work. I a to jump as high as you can, you have to absorb a reflexive movement. So you see the guys, let's say in like the NFL draft, you drop really quickly and then explode because you need. A ref, you need a reflex to contract fast. Okay. Yeah. So things Love like, it. so when you're doing speed of contraction, what you're talking about is adding no more than maybe 10% of your body weight. 
That's like, that's so hard to be like, I want to get really fast. Let me grab these sevens, right? It's like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> but you have to be able to, you have to be able to produce force fast. Um, it develop the speed of contraction develops in stiffness of the body. So when you hit something, when you hit the ground, there's not this sort of absorption of the ground into a person. You hitting the ground and nothing changes or very little changes, right? You're not like your joint angles aren't going to these like extreme sort of uh, um, flexion degrees and then you're popping up. You're just hitting and you're off. And the same thing goes with jumping, high running, fast, high jump, long jump. You like, you're hitting the ground with a stiff spring. Um, so I think that in combination with like, like doing heavy stuff allows you to push more weight. But to transfer that, you have to teach your body that it's not about how hard you push, but about how fast you can actually apply that force. That's like the leading principle. So, so if you, if you put it into kind of the order I was going through, mm -hmm. would you even still go through that order? And then just like, do you feel like that's accurate that, um, like, and I'm just in this, I'm in this place in my own coaching, my own understanding where I'm trying to put together the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's why. Um, like as an athlete who, man, when I was training hard, 120, 90 miles a week was consistent. That's what it takes to run a good 10K, a good 5K. You have to do that at the higher level. But now I want to pare that back down and give everybody some access to speed. I understand you cannot do too much plyos too much stiffening yeah. of the body when you're doing all that mileage yeah yeah but i feel like um so yeah i left one little piece of part of it yeah so i i made this one set of lifting that is similar to what you're talking about i actually stole it from uh the nba guys it's what they do to warm up before games like i took a routine yeah. Yeah, And all they're trying to do is maintain that power speed yeah. throughout the season, the jump height. Mm -hmm. And so it's similar, like five, six minutes recovery. So I guess my question is, if you're an endurance athlete, are all those things I was talking about necessary before you get to that plyo box jump? Or can you just skip that and go straight to the plyo box? Jump? No, so like at the first couple steps, you're like, okay, what you can do if you just go out and run as you are, you can move healthy, you can get through just a sprint, right? And then the next, and then the next step of it was, um, remind me again, I think it was on the on the track, like, like building power and then yeah, yeah. actually taking that power, using yeah. it on the hill, using it flat. Yeah, yeah, cool. So. I have a pretty unique perspective on it because I wasn't a sprinter. I'm a mid distance guy. Okay. My, my dad was a world-class swimmer. Um, his dad was a world-class swimmer at 50 to hundred meters. You're talking about as it equates to on the track, 400, 800. Okay. What I think it's about is latching on to a feeling. Okay. So like if you do something in the gym where you hit boom, boom, and you're getting it, right? And the speed of contraction is everything. That feeling is what you have to apply on the track, okay? So whatever you do, you can go out and just do it. And you might be a talented athlete. Obviously, you from your first try to like a year later, you'll be very different. But the, the opportunity is for you to feel a stiffening or feel the speed of contraction in the gym or through plyometrics that you haven't been able to put onto the track. And then you go and put it onto the track and see, can you feel it? Because once you feel it, you can tone down the volume because then you can make anything feel like this, right? And then you can just doing a jump or two jumps in a row can remind yourself of, okay, what does that feel like? Right. You could do that right before you run. You could, uh, um, you could do anything to turn that feeling on, but before you felt it, it, you have no reference point. So you might feel like you're going fast, 
but you know, you, you're not because you, you haven't had that feeling of like speed of contraction. So I'm, I'm worried less about, I, I like to teach less from like the physical. Yeah. You can go out and do it, but then you still got progress. Um, and like, this is how much volume, all this stuff, because even plyometrics, they, they measure plyometric workouts by, um, ground contacts. So like a high, high volume plyometric workout might be 300 ground contacts. You should know, you should be nowhere near that as a distance runner, right? You're talking about a hundred minimum, 80, 60, something like that. Um, but what you get out of that is if you, you don't have to do as much volume, if you can mentally hold on to the feeling of what it feels like when you're doing high intensity, high um, impact plyometrics and make no mistake like plyos are high impact because the, the the whole goal of it is to hit the ground as hard as you can as fast as you can if you think you're just gonna cruise into that that's a different it's a whole different game yeah i i guess my i guess my uh my approach and my mentality towards that is Man, don't go straight to the plyos. Let's yeah, yeah. like, let's develop yeah. uh, easier to develop pieces mm -hmm. of the puzzle before yeah. we get there so that you don't, you know, man, yeah. rupture something Rub. that <laughs> has no, that has no mobility, yeah. that has no strength Absolutely. and that hasn't been through a range of motion mm -hmm. while sprinting. Yeah. That's that's why in my mind, like the last step is we go to the gym and really try to go fast on the ground, yeah. off the ground. Is yeah. that would you would you agree with that? I would I would definitely recommend like you. There's so many steps before that, right? But you always got to mind one of the main steps before that is like you well not before that. One of the main steps after that is you connect with it. You connect and you go that back, type of back movement, movement versus just straight yeah. versus just straight volume, right? Yeah. Connecting with the feeling of of hitting the ground like that or jumping or whatever it is is the most important thing. And then you can decrease volume. So, like, I know a lot of training is all volume based, but like, it's just like any other cue. The cue is not the right way to do it. What I'm doing is I'm giving you the cue so you can attach yourself to a feeling. It's not yeah. about oh, this cue. This is how I run. Done. Let me get out there, set world records. It's let me give you this cue so you can feel something and then bring it into how you naturally move. I think that's kind yeah. of, that's an interesting uh, um, dichotomy of like coaching is when you do give someone a cue, they think, oh, got it, nailed it. Versus like, no, I'm just giving it to you so you feel that, that engagement and then you can hold on to it and reproduce it. Um, so I think speed is a lot like that as well. And we talk about speed of contraction, we're not just talking about hitting the ground, we're talking about hip extension and flexion, right? We're talking about knee extension and flexion. You can't isolate your way into speed. Okay. You yeah. Have, like you can do hamstring curls and uh le mm -hmm. and leg extensions, all that later once you've developed it to add on to it. Um even squats, but I think it's very important to understand like if you're committed to speed, you need to be committed to like a pretty aggressive attitude with your body and the ground. You know, I think, yeah. it, and you've got to flip Dude, your mindset a little bit. I, I love, uh, I love when I get like nuggets that connect dots. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, so I'm honored to be able to give a nugget on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that really does connect like a mental cue dot. Yeah. that I was like trying to get to. So yeah, sweet. Good, man. man. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, you guys uh, hit us up with more questions and we'll see you next time. Uh, Thank you guys that's so it much. For, yeah, that's it for episode seven. Have a good one. Thank you.